Hello, everyone. So my name is Stefano. I'm a final year undergraduate student in the UK. Uh, but last year was uh, in the US working with very, very nice people uh, working on a very, the, who are working on a very, very fancy device because the name is longer than seven letters. So it's Brain Computer Spinal Cord Interface. And to make it less fancy, then we said, well, it's BCSI. What does it do? Well, from experimental evidence, we know that um, this, uh, this machine is um, recording from single neuron activity, the motor cortex, applying a delay of some milliseconds and then stimulating the spinal cord. Because, for example, if you have spinal cord injury, you want to restore the pathways between the motor cortex and the spinal cord. So you want to use plasticity. And there is some plasticity occurring, because depending on the delay that you are... Oh, wait, where's the cursor? Uh, I can't find it. Anyway, uh, at the bottom, you see that if you are applying some, some delay, um, depending on the delay, you can have a different amount of potentiation. So on the right-hand side, you see you start from a baseline, you play the machine for a day, and you get, boom, a boost of 25%, for example, in a muscle. So I thought, well, how can I help? I mean, this is an amazing scientific community, and I would like to do something. So I thought, well, we can try to use a, a simple model that already existed with the help of my supervisors, and try to answer this question. So how can we model this computationally? Because we want to know more. We just know that it's up, something is happening, it's potentiating, but we want to know uh, something more. So what is, what is happening to the other connections? So not only the connection between the motor cortex and the site where you're stimulating, but also to the other connections. And what if we stimulate multiple sites? Let's get crazy. I mean, if you have a model, you know, you can do crazy stuff. Um, and what uh, if we model spinal cord injury as well? Because um, monkeys here were healthy and you don't know if uh, the probability of connection is actually changing the results that you're getting. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, you need a structure. So the structure, uh, we went through many, many, and by many, I mean many papers uh, to know how these things are connected. So groups of excitatory neurons in the motor cortex, groups of inhibitory neurons in the motor cortex, and the same thing, excitatory and inhibitory in the spinal cord. Well, of course, not all the data were there. So some of them were like, hmm, this seems reasonable because you don't have the, the right values. And uh, we can guess that we have a higher connection between groups uh, that are targeting the same muscle, so muscle A and muscle A, for example. And then we can say, okay, for spinal cord injury, we can just um, lower the probability of connection between these groups. And then after that, uh, we need plasticity. We need to set a rule because we want to study plasticity. So plasticity then depends on when uh, the pre and when the postsynaptic neuron is spiking because you're working with a machine that is recording from a neuron and stimulating another uh, bunch of neurons. So we said, let's use uh, spike time independent plasticity, the classical one. So when the presynaptic neuron is firing before the postsynaptic, then boom, you get the increase. And otherwise, the connection weakens. Easy, straightforward. Then um, how do we make the neuron spike? Well, uh, God doesn't play dice. It turns out we're not God, so we can play dice. And so we said, OK, neurons are just dices that who probability of spiking depends on some external drive that we're giving, uh, some, some um, I mean, the BCSI that is active, and the spiking of the neurons that are synapsing onto the neuron that you're looking at. So what did we find? Well, we have four questions. We have four conclusions. The first one is that, boom, we match qualitatively what happened. So if you are stimulating, if you are recording from the motor cortex and stimulating one side of the spinal cord, that, that connection is growing exponentially and then decaying off when you're switching off the machine. And that happens as well if you're recording from motor cortex and stimulating another place in the motor cortex. But you get some other effects. You can see that there are some squiggly lines here that are changing. So there are some other effects. So we, we found ripple effects on other connections. We quantify them and we can look at them. Then we try to stimulate two sites, so motor cortex and spinal cord together. And we've seen that, yeah, this two, as you've seen here, they potentiate. But also we have another one that is growing faster and stronger. And that is not the connection between the recording and the stimulating site, but is the connection between the two stimulated sites. So that's something maybe, maybe interesting, to, uh, interesting to look at. And then also there are still some ripple effects here. What if now we stimulate both of the groups, but we have spinal cord injury? So we're severing the connection between motor cortex and spinal cord. 
Well, this effect, boom, drops down. So we can study that, um, and we, we, we know that this, uh, this effect is choked off. And we're running some more simulations. We're trying to find uh, a better site architecture for the model and apply different parameters. But if you want to know more, just come speak to me. I will be very happy with that. Thank you.